Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you very much to Professor Carvalho for hosting this event today, and thank you to Annette for doing such a good job organising it. And I think of all of the emerging technologies that we hear about at the moment, uh, blockchain, biotechnology, the Internet of Things, and so on, I think AI has the most power of all of them to transform our lives over the next generation. And as some of you will be aware, I've previously organised a few tech events in the European Parliament. Uh, at, the, at the Cobden Centre, we did the five-day-long blockchain summit in 2016 here in the European Parliament. And it's always very interesting to talk through how these technologies will work in different policy environments. Uh, but really, AI is the most fascinating of all. It brings together, uh, of course, theoretical computer science and mathematics, but also ethics and philosophy, and, of course, economics, which is one of the most interesting areas of all with respect to AI, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. But actually, very few universities at the moment teach courses in the economics of AI. Uh, a lot of economics undergraduate and graduate degrees will have multiple modules in something like the economics of commodities, for instance, but, but very few teach modules in the economics of AI. Uh, it's really at the cutting edge of this thinking, but that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting at the moment. Uh, in, in economics and economic history, there's a term that we use, uh, general purpose technologies, uh, in essence, things like electricity that, that permeate all of the economy. Uh, and, and AI really has the potential to be the most powerful generous, general purpose uh, technology so far. But it's also more than just a general purpose technology. Uh, more than any other technology, it really has the potential to be a new phase of evolution for human beings. Uh, and for that reason, I think it's also the most profound area of economics that we can study right now. And so today I'm going to touch on three key areas. First of all, I'm going to talk about conceptualizing the economics of artificial intelligence. Uh, who are the key thinkers and how is it different from some of the other areas of economics? Second of all, I'm going to talk about AI and the future of work. That's obviously what gets a lot of the headlines at the moment, but we'll go into some of the nuances. And then third of all, I'll talk about how the economics of AI is going to affect the superpowers in the coming years uh, and, and global hegemony. So first of all, then, conceptualizing the economics of AI. There have been some brilliant thinkers in this area over the last few decades, but actually most of them have not been economists. Most of them have been AI practitioners. And several of them have a lot to offer to help us think through these issues. Uh, one of them is Ray Kurzweil, who is now a director of engineering at Google. And actually, my, uh, my father set up and ran a software company for 25 years. And when I was a teenager, he would be constantly encouraging me to read the books of Ray Kurzweil, who would predict how AI was going to develop by looking at the, the processing powers in computers doubling, uh, doubling consistently. Uh, that's, it's what's known conventionally as Moore's Law. Uh, Gordon Moore was the CEO of Intel, and he wrote a paper showing that the number of transistors that would fit on an integrated circuit was doubling every two years or so. But more concretely for us, what that means is essentially computers become twice as powerful roughly every 18 months to two years. And that's been going on for decades. Uh, that's why the phone, the smartphone in your pocket now is, is thousands if not millions of times as powerful as the supercomputers that we used to put a man on the moon in the late 1960s. Um, one of the other things that Kurzweil talks about is how the human brain is, is not very good at computing these types of exponential trends. So our brains developed on the African savanna, let's say 100,000 years ago. So if you, if you increase something sequentially, one, two, three, four, five, six, when you get to the 10th iteration, you have 10, at the 20th iteration, you have 20, and so on. But if you start doubling things, one, two, four, eight, 16, at the 10th iteration, you have about 1,000. At the 20th iteration, you have about a million. And at the 30th iteration, you have about a billion. So that's how you can see over time that computers become so much more powerful. 
Now, Moore's Law trends in CPUs, the type of chips in your laptop, uh, is, has started slowing, but it's actually speeding up in some of the other types of chips which are used for AI. But, but that's not the whole story, uh, Moore's Law. Another thing uh, that's useful for us is uh, John Launchbury, who was head of the Information Innovation Office at DARPA. That's essentially the part of the US military that plots out, uh, that comes up with really far out technological projects. Uh, so they essentially invented the internet and GPS, and more recently uh, they led the program on self driving cars and so on. And Launchbury talks about three waves of AI. Uh, the first wave is handcrafted AI. So that's programmers actually programming intelligence in by hand. So if you think about AI that plays chess, someone would actually have to program in all of the openings and how to play a game of chess at different stages. Uh, but that obviously has its limitations. So the second wave is machine learning, which is what we're in at the moment. And again, to continue the, the chess idea, that's where AI will, will learn how to play chess, uh, either by looking at other games or just by playing itself, which the more recent neural networks do. Uh, and, and that's how actually self-driving cars developed. Uh, it was very difficult to, pr to program them using handcrafted AI, uh, but through machine learning, that was achieved. But that wave still has its limitations. So the third wave that Launchbury talks about is contextual adaptation. So in the machine learning wave, uh, let's say an AI could become very good at telling the difference between a dog and a cat, for sake of argument. Um, but it does need to see a million dogs and a million cats to be able to do that. So that, uh, that has its limitations, whereas in the third wave of contextual adaptation, if you think about a human, a human child, for instance, can learn very quickly the difference between a dog and a cat. And when we move into this third wave of AI, uh, that's, that, will be, that will be the key new capability. And actually, a lot of what we think of uh, as quote-unquote artificial intelligence, what's come from the movies and sci-fi and so on, is more third wave AI. Um, and then one more point just on conceptualizing the economics of AI. There's an idea called machina economicus. Uh, in economics, we often like to, to model things with this idea of what's called homo economicus, the, the economic man or person. Um, and really it's this idea of a perfectly rational utility maximizer. Uh, now obviously it's, it's not realistic in any serious sense, but it's been useful for economic modeling. But as artificial intelligence becomes more prominent in the economy, let's say when AI can buy your insurance for you or do your holiday for you, and so on and so on. Actually, whereas we know consumer psychologists will talk about how much humans are influenced by the colors on the website and the shapes and, and the design layout and so on, uh, an AI ordering that for you will be something closer to the economic modeling of a perfectly rational utility maximizer. So actually a lot of those economic models that have been built up over the last 60 or 70 years, which have been somewhat farcical in many cases, become more relevant because it is, it is something approaching that. And that then brings me on to, to the second part of this talk, which is AI and the future of work. Uh, and this is really what gets a lot of the headlines in the newspapers. Uh, a, a lot of it dates back to, to an Oxford, a paper from two researchers at Oxford University in 2013, Fry and Osborne. Uh, and the headline figure from that was that 47% of work in America is liable to be automated, I think, f f by the mid-2030s. Uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, it's, it's around 30% of work by the mid-2030s. And McKinsey and so on, that they all produce similar papers. But it's worth digging down into it, because a lot of it is actually processes that are going to be automated rather than jobs. So the OECD uh, have done some really good work on this where they break it down strictly in terms of processes. So we're not talking about 30 or 40 or 50% unemployment uh, or job churning or anything. If you take an example of something like a social media manager or a graphic designer, uh, a lot of what they do even now is quite repetitive. Um, so someone working on Photoshop, a lot of the more tedious stuff is and will continue to be automated. So it doesn't mean we're not going to have graphic designers. It means those repetitive tasks are, go are going to be automated by AI so that they can then focus on the core human capability, which is the creativity. 
So it's important not to become uh, pessimistic about these AI developments uh, in economics. We're not moving into a world of 30 or 40 or 50 percent unemployment. Uh, this is really a world m most technological revolutions so far uh, have not just made people wealthier and made more products available. They've also made people's lives more pleasant. Uh, few, few people now working as graphic designers or social media managers would want to give that up and go and work down the coal mine or, or in some factory uh, doing the same thing all day, every day. And AI will be similar. It will pull more people out of drudgery. But it's also worth noting, related to this, that actually productivity growth has been quite stagnant in recent years. Uh, and many people are saying now that millennials, uh, the generation born from the early 1980s onwards, will be the first generation for some time that will be poorer than their parents. In fact, you could even argue the first generation since perhaps before the Industrial Revolution that will be poorer than their parents. Uh, and there's this, it's kind of technical to define what that means, but there's some good articles in the Financial Times and some work by the World Economic Forum. But it touches on a Nobel Prize winning economist, Robert Solow, uh, and, and the work that he did, on, essentially on long-term economic growth, showed that about 87% of long-term economic growth comes from technology. Uh, but there's also what's known as the Solow Paradox, uh, and, and that uh, was related to the computing revolution, where he said, we see the computer revolution everywhere out about us, but not in the productivity statistics. So in the Industrial Revolution, for instance, you, before the Industrial Revolution, you had someone, let's say, making pairs of trousers, and they might be able to make a pair of trousers every two days or so, uh, cutting the cloth and stitching. Then the Industrial Revolution happens. You have machines everywhere, and all of a sudden, they can produce 20 pairs of trousers a day, or whatever it happens to be. So if you look at productivity over human history, it's essentially flat like this. Uh, medieval Europe was not really any more productive than, let's say, the Romans or even the Bronze Age. Then you hit the Industrial Revolution and it shoots up like this as all of these machines lead to massive increases in productivity. But we're not really seeing that with uh, AI so far. Uh, now, there's, there's a couple of points here. First of all, for instance, in terms of the uh, graphic designer, unlike, let's say, the factories of the Industrial Revolution, they're not necessarily producing more stuff. It may just enable them to be more creative as the, uh, as the, the more um, tedious tasks become automated. But also, I think probably uh, the, the Industrial Revolution, a lot of the huge productivity gains happened uh, several waves into it, let's say, to continue launch breeze analogy. I suspect it's going to be the third wave of AI that's going to really bring those massive productivity gains. Uh, but it just reinforces this point. There's a lot of talk at the moment about taxing robots. Um, th we don't need to be talking about this right now. You know, we have, uh, we have essentially the first generation for, for arguably centuries that will be poorer than their parents. We have very low productivity growth. We have very low unemployment. We're not seeing any of the signs that some of these people are talking about. So we actually need the opposite of that. We need as much AI and as much robotics research as possible. So that then brings me on to the third part of my talk, which is the economics of AI and global hegemony in the 21st century. Now, I mentioned in my intro that... Artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology, uh, similar to electricity and so on. Uh, but in the case of AI, it also has a lot of military applications. And historically, roughly since about the 1700s, it's tended to be the most economically dominant countries in the world that have also dominated militarily. So there actually hasn't been a Genghis Khan since then riding around on horseback building a huge empire. Uh, today, in the 21st and, and in the 20, 20th century, it was the companies that had the strongest economies and were most technologically advanced um, that, were, that were the global hegemons. Uh, of course, there's Britain and then America, and now we have the rise of China. I think more and more people are recognizing that AI is going to be the key to a lot of this hegemony in the 21st century, uh, both economic and closely connected to that uh, militarily. Right now, it's really America and China that are dominant. So roughly about three quarters of the venture capital, some people say four fifths of all global venture capital and AI is going to America and China between them. Uh, there's an interesting talk 
in China by uh, Li Minghai from the People's Liberation Army's National Defense University, who said, uh, China is shifting from, quote, systems confrontation to, quote, algorithms competition, uh, and superior, superiority in algorithms leads to, quote, warfighting superiority. I also uh, give him a full quote because this is very interesting. He says, we can perceive that today warfighting has evolved from bloody struggle for storming castles and capturing territories in the uncivilized and barbaric age into information-driven precision operations and intense contests in the domain of high intelligence. So we are moving into this world of, of what he calls algorithms competition. Um, uh, and again, the, the People's Liberal Liberation Army's National Defense University is laying out this roadmap for China to become the leader in AI uh, they say by 2030. But it's also somewhat reminiscent of the 20th century competition between a centrally planned economy and free enterprise. Although, of course, China is a lot more capitalist than the Soviet Union, in terms of this AI project, it, is, it has a lot of facets of central planning. But whereas, of course, in the 20th century, no one in their right mind would have bought consumer products from the Soviet Union... Uh, cars or washing machines or toasters or whatever. They actually led in certain areas uh, in the space program. They were the first to put a satellite into space. They were the first to put a human being into space and so on. So in this competition between China and America and potentially Europe uh, and, and others like India, it's worth bearing in mind that if we look at investment in AI, um, unlike a lot of that Cold War military investment, it has both elements to it. Uh, research in one area of AI also usually has applications elsewhere. The same types of algorithms and neural networks that are useful for medical research are also useful for hedge funds and are also useful for intelligence agencies. Uh, so I think uh, it, that, that presents a lot of opportunities uh, in the coming years uh, for, for, for areas for military investment. Uh, investing in AI research within that context is, is a lot more productive for the rest of the economy as opposed to just buying some tanks or fighter jets or whatever it happens to be. And so to conclude, really, first of all, rather than thinking of artificial intelligence as a, as a kind of monolithic technology, it's more useful to think about, as, as John Launchbury talked about, these three waves of AI uh, there are other, other thinkers that have talked about similar ideas, but I think Launchbury's uh, outline is very clear. Uh, Moore's law is now, is now slowing for, for CPU chips, the types in your computer, but is actually speeding up for, for a lot of AI chips. And that ties into Launchbury talking about uh, the, these, these new waves of AI. Uh, the benefits of AI... Uh, have been somewhat uncertain uh, in terms of Solo's paradox. It really cast doubt on productivity gains. Uh, so that's all the more argument for not going in for these ideas like, uh, like taxing robots and AI uh, and so on. And uh, I think we, we certainly don't need to worry about mass unemployment caused by AI anytime soon. We're not seeing those signals yet. Uh, but really, uh, I think there's a great opportunity here for Europe that if it's looking for where to invest, AI has so many different applications, uh, as we've talked about today, uh, that, that it really is, uh, to say it has a strong future uh, over, the, over the coming uh, generation will be an understatement. Thank you very much.